Welcome to another episode of Pandemic Dialogues. I am Luke Perez of Arizona State University, and I am joined once again by my co-host, Trevor Shelley. In our previous episode, we discussed Camus' resurgence in popularity in the wake of COVID-19's global spread. Camus' novel fictionalizes an outbreak of bubonic plague in the North African town of Oran and serves as a framework for thinking about political order, disorder, and civic renewal. In this episode, we discuss part one of the novel, which Camus uses to set the stage for the remainder of the book. Several key characters and themes are introduced to us. We examine these characters, the significance of their different responses to the perplexity of dead rats all over the town, and to the realization that after a centuries-long hiatus, the plague has returned. New subscriptions and reviews help others discover this podcast. So if you like this episode, we invite you to subscribe, like, or review this episode in whatever your favorite podcast app is. Thank you. Trevor, good to see and hear you once again while we are both socially distancing in our relative bunkers. And I hope you and your family are healthy. We certainly are in my household. Last time we, I think, did a really good job introducing the work broadly and allowed our audience who's going to join us on this journey to sort of see the relevance of Camus' work and some of the themes that are in it in the broadest of strokes. And now we're going to be talking about part one of the book. We've discussed before how there are several main parts to this book. And this first one, from which our preface, which we discussed, was taken, begins to introduce many of the major plot points and characters, all of which punctuated by this mystery about rats. In the book, we see our main character, a doctor, Ryu, who is sending his wife off to a sanatorium. She's been ill. We see him going on about his rounds. While he's on his rounds, there is a rat that's been discovered in his apartment complex, goes on his rounds. There are more rats all over the city. And on this sort of journey and this mystery of what's causing these dead rats to emerge, we're introduced to many of the other characters in the book. Rambar, Turo, Petard, Grand, a doorman who becomes the first casualty of the plague. It's quite interesting because while we, the readers, are mostly concerned about this kind of mystery, this detective mystery of the rats, we're almost blinded to the coming plague, much in the same way that the characters were, unless we're paying attention. The rats emerge mysteriously. Their numbers grow almost exponentially. They're found on the streets in such great multitude that at one point in the book, the city is loading them out of the town to be incinerated by the truckload. You can imagine, you know, large garbage trucks full, you know, by the dozen being carried out of town. And then suddenly the rats disappear. And if that were the whole story, then obviously there would be no novel. And so we know that there's something else going on. And this becomes, I think, the window for us to think through many of the themes recurring throughout this work because there's this sudden realization that as soon as we thought we were about to return to political order, a kind of normal state of affairs wherein there are no rats in town and we can go back to our commercial republic, commercial enterprise that characterized or that the narrator characterized the city as, that becomes an illusion. And we're suddenly confronted with the realization that this new disease is emerging all over town with the same kind of intensity and uh, multiplicity as the rats were, but now people are dying. And it's at the very end of this first part of the novel, we get that telegram from, from outside to wall off the city and declare a state of plague. Yeah, Camus really does in this first part work through a variety of ups and downs due to the uncertainty of the circumstances in the situation. This ebb and flow from a kind of fear to confidence, you know, panic and relief. And there, there's quite a, a dynamism of emotions and, and possible responses and means of trying to anticipate and address uh, the, the circumstances. And no doubt, uh, the rats is a good place to, to begin. And in fact, it, at the beginning of the second part or second section of this first part, we're reminded, uh, maybe it's worth recalling something that we framed the discussion by last time. And I think it's not by accident that Camus here uses the same phrase that I pointed out before uh, in the French, something out of place. 
Uh, in this translation, it does say that when Ryu comes across a, a rat, a dead rat, it occurred to him that it had no business to be on his landing. All the same, this idea of the rat being out of place, that things are out of order, that there's some kind of dynamic and concern about order and disorder, and also the ordinary and the extraordinary, as we discussed last time, this applying as much to peoples and events. But here, I think we're fur- one further kind of dyad we can consider is that between health and disease. I mean, certainly the rat does represent the oncoming plague and the, and the broader issue of a disease, which of course raises the question of health. I mean, what is health after all? And sometimes we only think seriously about health when we are faced with a disease. And this is as much true for our, our personal lives and the health of our bodies. But it's something that I think Camus is raising here with respect to our body politic, right? uh, the, the polity itself and the health of our political life, the health of our communities. And this is quite a challenge. I mean, what is the way to think about the health of, you know, of a people's life together? That's a good insight. I think thinking about health in terms of disease, and as you've said, order within disorder gets us back into this, what we normally think of as like the history of political theory or the history of politics, that analogy of a healthy political regime is a recurring theme for thinkers about politics. And I don't think it's a surprise that Camus is using that as an indirect way to point us to questions that we want to be asking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe another theme we can pick up on that, that is in the opening pages of this first part is that of separation. Uh, we, we come across the, the first moment of illness upon which follows the first act of separation, which namely is between the doctor and his wife. I mean, here's a curious thing, right? That the doctor's wife is the one who is ill, being sent off to a sanatorium, and there is this separation that takes place within the very family of the doctor, of the potentially leading uh, protagonist. And this theme of, of separation, which of course is contrasted with a kind of togetherness or sort of unity versus isolation is something we're going to see over the course of this novel as well, dealing with presently with our own isolation, uh, but is another theme that we, we come across right away that I think follows on that. In that passage, when Mrs. Ryu was being sent off, I made similar observations about what's being previewed or foretold by this um, exchange, because we don't really know what her disease is. It's a mystery, at least to us, at least for the moment. And in many ways, because of this illness that she presumably is going to be spared the real horror of what's about to befall this town. And I think it's a really striking depiction of a relationship between a husband and wife, because just as she's getting ready to leave, he himself is full of anxiety and guilt because he feels responsible for her being sick. And it's quite possible he is responsible in the sense that he could be such a, a workaholic to being a doctor that he's actually neglected his wife. But even if you take um, that exchange, terribly, he still has the guilt of thinking that perhaps he could have done more, maybe seen one less patient and would have been more attentive to her and could have prevented whatever illness that she has, even if in truth or even if in reality that never really would have helped. You nevertheless see a man who is stricken with this. I think also what we see in this early exchange is a preview of the kinds of separation that we're going to see later, which is to say that human beings cannot really be isolated. I think you and I and everyone else who's socially distancing are experiencing many of these same kinds of forms of isolation that Netflix and chill, so to speak, isn't actually enough to fulfill us as human beings, that we we need more than being to ourselves. It's impossible actually to be a man or woman alone without everyone else or without any form of interaction. We need more, we yearn for more, and we're getting the very first glimpse of that in that exchange and looking at the anxiety that both Mr. and Mrs. Ryu are experiencing because just as she's about to finally leave, he says to her, when you're back, we'll make a fresh start. And she's cheered up by that. She has a sense of hope of thinking about what's to come. And there might not actually be a a renewal. It's quite possible that one or both of these characters are dead by the end of the novel, or even if they're not, once she's back, what kind of renewal 
or what kind of new beginning they'll be able to actually have is going to be structured largely by the immense forms of isolation, of disease, of disorder that these pages are about to narrate for us. Yeah, that's nice. I think the idea of a fresh start here is a way of thinking about how the possibilities of renewal can be found within situations of disorder. When we are ill, we long for health and we think about it a little more clearly, perhaps. It's situations of disorder and of disease that focus the mind in longing for the opposite. But, uh, but let's turn now to sort of one of the next episodes, the introduction of the character Raymond Rombert, who is, of course, a journalist. He comes from the big city, from Paris, to this colonial outpost. And, uh, and there's a very interesting exchange between Rombert and the Dr. Rieu that sets up a way of thinking about the differences between, say, the media and, and science, or uh, an intellectual and a doctor. And Rieu and Rombert engage in this, in this dialogue where Rieu asks Rombert, with respect to the, the writing of his story, whether or not he would, in fact, publish the truth. And so we have here the introduction of the question uh, of truth, and there's some insistence on the part of Ryu that the truth must be, must be conveyed. The journalist takes this with a certain degree of skepticism, you might say, and he smiles in responding to Ryu saying, you, you talk the language of Saint-Just. Saint-Just, of course, a, a revolutionary from the French revolutionary past, and this gives us some insight into the perhaps intellectual nature of the categories that the, the journalist thinks through. Rather, Ryu responds and says he knows nothing about that, uh, and in fact, for his part, he wants no truck with injustice and compromises with the truth. And this seems to be uh, something of an important statement about, about the character of Ryu. Th- that's a really good point. Reminded me I wanted to ask you something about this, because when I was reading this section, I, ha- I highlighted the same exchange, and I noted the same reference to uh, Sanjus, who was part of the terror during the French Revolution, and tended to view truth in absolutist terms. And Ryu's character, when in response to being associated with him, says that he knows nothing of the sort. And I, it seems to me like we could take this in one of two ways, right? One way is, is maybe to think about it as a, a function of their different types of training, right? One is a journalist. He's an intellectual. He's part of the, the, the French elite in Paris. Another one is a technician. He's a medical doctor in a province in the outskirts, right? He's in North Africa, not in Paris. And so he never had time to, to read, you know, intellectual history. So he doesn't want to be bothered with it. And as a doctor, he's not even really concerned with philosophy per se, but with what doctors are concerned with, which is to say empirics, science, and medicine. So that's one way I think we could take it. And another way is maybe to see what Camus is asking us to think about in regard to truth, that there's a way of, of seeing truth as absolutist, as transcendent, as, as maybe even dogmatic, imposed from above without our consent, or as something that is utterly relativistic and subject only to the uh, perspective or the viewpoint or the feelings of individuals as they see it. And I'm wondering if, if you have a response to maybe either of those two ways or maybe something else that you might be able to add to that. Yeah, well, I think there is something to the idea that Rombert is an, an intellectual of sorts who thinks in terms of the categories of an intellectual, using referring to Saint-Just and Ryu, on the other hand, who says he knows nothing of that, uh, is much more focused on the practical task and the duties that are before him. To the extent that he has technical knowledge, I think he's also someone who is very much concerned with the, the well-being of his patients. He's bound to them, not just as a doctor, but in, in some other way. This does indeed raise something that is important to Camus' thought, this, this notion of the rebel. Here we have juxtaposed Saint-Just, the revolutionary who was indeed involved with the, the terror, seeking to exact uh, the purity of justice, maybe, uh, if it meant murder bloodshed and the like, whereas the rebel that Camus is encouraging, you might say, uh, or promoting, is, is one who has something of the care of the Dr. Ryu, 
but is bound in a certain way by by limits. And if I could, there's a passage that's worth reading to shed some light on this. In his work by the title of The Rebel, Camus writes, if rebellion could found a philosophy, it would be a philosophy of limits, of calculated ignorance and of risk. He who does not know everything cannot kill everything. And so the rebel of the kind that Camus endorses and that perhaps um, is juxtaposed against the Saint-Just is one who has a certain, you might say, epistemological s- skepticism, really does move between the twin extremes on the one hand of a kind of relativism without any truth or any justice and an absolutism that is just that, fixed and absolute. And Camus was wary of, of falling into nihilism, but was also of a mind that we could no longer rely on the traditions and the fixed truths of the past. Again, this is, as you said, not to say that there are no truths at all, but the rebel of a Camusian variety is one who maneuvers through the twin extremes with an understanding of what his duties are, and it just may be they are the duties of a kind that a Dr. Ryu finds and responds to in his care and concern for others. I want to respond to something you, you said. It's giving me some insight. I think into another character, Teru is, is how you pronounce his, his name. You had described this resistance of or reluctance and our ability to rely on traditional sources of truth. Even while we're not going to descend into nihilism, we have to kind of be skeptics at your quote from The Rebel, which was written after the plague, points in a direction, maybe back to the first political philosophers, the kind of the Socratic tradition of being mindful of our limits of human knowledge, and that therefore we have to begin as skeptics and investigate. And one way that we investigate the truth, especially of human affairs, is to engage in dialogue with other people about what they know and see how it might influence us. And while you were talking, I was thinking about this second narrator that we have. We are introduced to this gentleman who is an out-of-towner, who is of some means, we don't really know. He's staying in a hotel downtown, and the narrator himself is privy to this person's notes. Maybe he is Taru himself, maybe he's someone else and has access to this man's diary, but we get a kind of second narration within this narration, and it's almost as if that narration is juxtaposed as a kind of dialogue that we have to then construct together Maybe perhaps the narrator himself and Taru had some private exchange. There's something there about how we ourselves need to proceed in our investigation of the truth going forward, but I myself have not really had a a chance to think through exactly what it is Camus is suggesting that we do. Yeah, there is something very interesting about this narrator or narration within a narration, and I think it does speak to... Camus' insight that, whether one shares it or not, that accessing the truth or finding the just requires a multitude of perspectives, right? A kind of perspectivalism, perhaps. Uh, And he demonstrates that by way of the form in which he introduces and includes Taru's narration to add an additional perspective here. And no doubt, uh, with all of these characters that we're now introduced to, we want to think of them in relation to one another by comparing and contrasting them and thinking about their different responses, modes of action, and self-understanding. But in light of the differences of the characters, Luke, I, I, maybe we could think of the different classes as well of responders, right? We have here the, the political class. We just suggested we have something of the media or journalistic class. We certainly have the class of doctors. There is an exchange, perhaps, within some of those classes, certainly the political and doctor class, some disagreement and discussion within classes, but also across these different classes or groups as well, and the struggle to maybe bring them into some harmony. Sometimes they're at odds with one another, at tension. Uh, What can be said about that? And maybe this is a way to to think about the, some of the political responses or or strategic responses as well. I think when we reflect upon the ways in which these various characters belonged to a particular class. You're right to identify them. And what I find interesting is not that they are hierarchical classes, right? It's not socioeconomic classes 
in the way that a Marxist would want us to view the world. But each of these classes have a different kind of way of looking at the world, and they're going to bring what, what you might think of as, as their prior belief systems or their prior sets of received wisdom. And that's one of the things that I found interesting while working through this part of the novel, especially in regard to how they were going to solve first the problem of the rats and then ultimately the problem of the plague. I was actually thinking of Bayesian statistics. I should caution our audience that a fancy word uh, uh, or a fancy approach for thinking about how individuals make inferences between data and conclusions. And I'm not a statistician, but anyone who's gone through a PhD program in the social sciences, as you and I have, is introduced or steeped in a Bayesian approach because it's a very powerful way of thinking through the way that we proceed from evidence to conclusion. And the Reader's Digest version of this is that nobody is a blank slate, goes out into the world every day or every moment and evaluates all data in a vacuum. Each person has a set of conclusions or things that they hold to be true. That's what we call their priors. And in light of new evidence, evaluates or updates what their priors actually are. That, I think, is something that we see on the page because as it becomes clear to each of these characters and each of these different classes that it's plague, there's a reluctance within the medical class as well as the governmental class, as well as all the other various characters, that it can be plague because we see time and time again, the narrator explains to us, they're all convinced that it's not plague because we got rid of that centuries ago. It can't be plague. It has to be something else. There's a very poignant debate amongst the, the medical doctors at one point in, in the narration, and Ryu already knows that it's plague. It, it seems clear to me. And so does another doctor who's a colleague of his, uh, Dr. Castell. Some of the other doctors are debating what to call it. They want to call it something different. They, some doctors want to call it plague. And Ryu's character says, it doesn't matter what you call it. We just need to start moving. I think he's aware that that debate is going to go on endlessly and that they're on borrowed time and they need to act. You see a similar type of reluctance to move on the part of the government for the same reason. There's a constant theme of local provincial governors or, or provincial government officials constantly telegramming to, to Paris or to some other part within the region to ask for orders or direction because they don't want to make decisions. They keep sort of throwing it off. They, they want to shunt their responsibility for owning the problem that's immediately in front of them. And this, I think, is a, a constant theme. We see this even today. We've not talked about, obviously, much. This theme, I think, is something that will be recognizable to anybody who's experiencing COVID-19 today. Many of our world governments we're not necessarily reluctant, but it seemed like they were reluctant to respond to the outbreak, I think in large part because there was a general sense globally that things like plague, these kinds of pandemics, are of the past. The last great flu pandemic was in 1918, and I think the renewed interest in both the Spanish plague and in Camus' novel reflects or maybe punctuates one of the topics that we discussed last episode about this skepticism that Camus has towards science as a type of tradition that is passed down to us, that even the scientific method or even statistics and data and all of the other types of technical knowledge that we take for granted need to be held in suspicion because it was this global belief that pandemics can't happen is, I think, what led many governments and many individuals, I mean, the types of comments that we saw and maybe even still see on social media dismissing this pandemic as made up or not serious or exaggerated reflect the kind of problem about knowledge that Camus wants us to take away. Certainly that skepticism regarding progress is found here. And I think rightly so, Camus illustrates more broadly that there is Kind of an inevitable tension between politics and science. One of the passages that I thought was most poignant about this idea and how people dismiss it, dismiss the seriousness of, of these kinds of pandemics, is 
the the narrator quotes that the the local population who so far had made a point of masking their anxiety by facetious comments now seem tongue tied and went about their ways with gloomy faces. I think what the narrator is getting at is the same kinds of dismissive comments that we get about this pandemic in our day and in the the fictionalization in this novel is largely, I think, a response to a recognition that what they thought was true is no longer true. The anxiety that they feel is a, a coming realization or a coming to grips with the fact that the promises of science and technology are maybe not as sound as we were led to believe. That introduces, I think, also the dynamic, the changing dynamics of the circumstance, right? The fluidity of things as they unfold, and they are unfolding before us, but also in this novel. I mean, it's very easy in retrospect to say, the politicians should have done this. This course of action ought to have been taken. Why didn't they do more? And, you know, Camus shows for us that there is, shows to us that there is a almost inevitable tension between these different classes or groups or however we want to characterize them. Uh, In this case, between, I think, the scientific uh, and medical community and the political community, there is a sense of frustration on the part of Rieu and some of his colleagues that, you know, let's, I mean, the prefect and the politicians, I mean, enough with another health committee. Let's just take a course of action, right? Like, we, we know what ought to be done or something ought to be done. Let's just do it. But the, you know, the office of a politician and the duties and responsibilities of a politician are a little bit different, you know, their interests, their sense of, of honor uh, and what they care about or what they're concerned with is not always perfectly aligned with the concern of, say, a medical doctor. So there is the tension that unfolds here as much as in retrospect, like I said, we could say that the medical class clearly knew that more should have been done. And indeed, Camus says that for the Dr. Rieu, where his certitude lay was in his daily round, right? And this is one. And the thing was to do your job as it should be done. But it's not self-evident at all times what everyone's job is. If, if it's a little more evident what your job is as a medical doctor, it's not always as formulaic, perhaps, or technical uh, in the case of the politician. A contemporary of, um, of Albert Camus, Raymond Aron, used to ask his students when they were upset with their government uh, ministers and elected officials, you know, ask them outright, what would you do if you were minister, right? It's all very good and well to, to theorize about things. But when it is necessary to take a course of action and to really think through some of the concerns, say, that the prefect has about causing too much alarm, you know, instilling panic in the people, maybe taking a more cautious approach, a little more hesitation. I mean, there are real political concerns, uh, again, about, about order and disorder and setting off alarm bells unnecessarily. I think that hits it on the head. In fact, a little while ago, we were talking about strategy when I was making a brief digression in, into Bayes and how we sort of update and why certain individuals might be slow to update to the conclusion that would seem obvious to the reader that plague is in, in the town. One thing to keep in mind when thinking about the characters who are in government in this novel is that if they make a wrong decision, it can go wrong in two ways. And one of their priors is that they could declare plague and it not actually be plague. Up until the moment that they realize that plague is in the town, I think their biggest fear is getting a false positive because that would be disastrous and that would probably be for them the worst thing possible. In truth, it's only the second worst thing possible next to what actually happens is they don't declare that it's plague until it's too late. But you can imagine what would happen if they announced that it was plague and started the process of fortifying the city and closing the gates and doing all the things that were necessary, and then have it turn out that it wasn't plague. Not only are there jobs probably on the line, but you can imagine the kind of reputational damage to the entire town, the commerce of this town. We're told that it's a commercial city in the opening pages. Who would want to go to Iran and do business if they heard in the papers that first it was reported plague and then not? That type of person, I think, would conclude that maybe it really was plague and the government came in and said, no, 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 it wasn't plague. We've seen, I think, examples of this in recent times about the ways that that these kinds of outbreaks are managed. So it's no surprise, right? And what this ends up doing, I think, for us is highlighting the problem of responsibility and agency 
when there is no agent to the actual problem. Right? And it's not just in, in pandemics when this becomes relevant to us. We see this, I think, sometimes with natural disasters, but the part of the human mind is to always assign responsibility for causes. We want to see the origin of a cause. And when something happens to us, and when we lament, why me? Why my town? Why now? In one way, it's a cry for help, an appeal to heaven. But in another way, it's actually an accusation to God, to government, to somebody. Why did you do this to me? Why did you, the plague, befall this town? The problem, I think, is that it's not really anybody's fault because you can't really have justice and injustice without human agency. And so this is, I think, what the people of Iran in all of the various classes, the common citizens, the doctors, the journalists, the politicians, all of them individually and all of them collectively as a community are trying to figure out responsibility. There is another way to think about responsibility, I think, which is to say that somebody can take ownership of the issue. And that's ultimately what has to happen, that there's this collective problem and there's a need or a yearning to, to look to somebody to take ownership and work the problem. You see that early on with the rats when the townspeople say, what are the city fathers? That's the term that is used in the book to talk about the political officials. What are the city fathers going to do about the rats? And then later it's what are the city fathers going to do about this illness that's breaking out? The parallel that we see though is that the rat problem is an easy one to figure out. We collect the dead rats and we incinerate them. But the plague as we're about to see, I think, in the next part of the, the novel, is a much more difficult and complex problem and doesn't necessarily have a solution that government can do about it. And moreover, we're going to see that maybe there are, are some problems that we don't want government to take ownership of. And as much as we see the tensions and the contrast within these different groups and these characters in the novel, Camus reminds us of just how challenging the virtue of prudence is, and this question of limits and moderation on the part of any actor is never so obvious. As I said before, it's not, it's not something that's formulaic. It is curious that by the end of this first part, it's the doctor uh, who maybe both does conform and does not conform to this archetype of a, of a kind of a medical practitioner. It is the doctor who says, when he's especially frustrated with the, the slow uh, moving the boring of, of boards, as it were, of the politi of the politicians, uh, that a, a degree of imagination is needed. And so the relationship between reason and imagination and this challenge that we're always faced with when we have questions about prudence is something Camus raises for us here as well. That gets, I think, to one of the last questions I wanted to ask you, because when we talk about imagination, I know the passage, is, I have it underlined as well. He's like, orders, orders, orders is there's a kind of frustration that the doctor says to himself when referring to the political officials when what we need is imagination. In other words, we need moral imagination. I don't know how we get moral imagination without thinking about the problem of language. There's a passage earlier that we've already talked about when the medical doctors and a handful of the politicians are talking about whether or not they should call it plague. Do we name it plague or name it something else? Reuse character doesn't seem to care what they call it because something needs to be done. And so there he seems to be pushing against imagination, but maybe that's perhaps because he himself has already named it. He knows what it is. And he knows, I think, that if they spend time trying to name it, more delay will happen. Or maybe something else is going on there. Maybe you can help me understand yeah, well, there certainly is something here that Camus is drawing our attention to regarding language and its challenges as well. When you name something, you've taken the first step towards maybe knowing what a thing is. You've certainly demarcated it from the things that it's not. Of course, it's not always clear what things ought to be called, and this is one of the challenges of this situation for many of the observers. And, um, and one of the characters also draws us to this attention of language. There's this character, Monsieur Grand who himself struggles with putting things into words, and yet he is seemingly a, an individual who is 
engaging in some work at home of writing. He's a, a student of Latin. So how to articulate things properly and clearly is part of what it means to think clearly as well as act accordingly. This connection is one of the deep tensions that I think we find in, in Camus' philosophy and indeed is presented to us in, in the form of this novel. The lack of clarity of the circumstances, I mean, he doesn't indeed compare the plague to a war, right? We know there's this expression, the fog of war, in the midst of the fog of war or the fog of plague. How do we find clarity? And maybe we can't always properly articulate things. Maybe we are called to act without a proper understanding. Maybe it really is, in the Ryuian fashion, a matter of just doing one's duty. And at the most fundamental level, maybe that means caring for one another, looking after and attending to our fellow human beings. Uh, that's, that's perhaps, again, what this rebel of a Camusian variety is maybe calling us towards. One final addition to, to that line of thinking before we wrap up, you talked about the need to act accordingly or the need to do one's duty. I think that is a great way of thinking about one of the tensions of this main character, Ryu, because he says in, in several passages that he views sort of justice as doing one's duty as it ought to be done. He's a very practical man. He doesn't see justice as something theoretical. I think that echoes back to that exchange with the journalist. The claim that justice should be practical is problematic because to have a practical sense of justice presupposes to have a theoretical sense of justice. You can't know how to act accordingly or how to do something as it ought to be done unless you have some kind of pre-visualization, to borrow a term from Ansel Adams, about what that final product looks like. And so if I, as a medical doctor, if I'm Ryu and I'm treating a patient, I have to have something in my mind, right, about what a healthy patient looks like. And that then at least leads me into the direction of a theoretical sense of justice or a philosophical sense of justice, even if I am, as Ryu seems to be, an eminently practical man. That, I think, is going to be one of these key tensions that we're going to see time and time again throughout the work. But I think for the sake of time, maybe we'll just sort of wrap up and begin to preview what we have planned for our next episode. Part two is a very long part. I think it's roughly 100 pages in your edition. I'm reading an older used edition. You and I have decided to read the first five sections of part two in our next episode. And then we're going to move on to the remainder of part two in the episode following that. So for anybody who is reading along with us, you can read all of part two, but just know that we're going to have um, two episodes to cover this long part. In addition, for anyone who is following us, if you are on Twitter, you can use hashtag Camus and hashtag ASU to comment about these passages. Not surprisingly, there is a global interest in Camus. And so the hashtag Camus is being used by many, many more people on social media than are listening to this podcast. And honestly, I think I should encourage all of you to look at that hashtag and see the kinds of comments and suggestions and insights that people are drawing from that work for their own purposes, but as well as if you want to engage with us, or you can at reply me or Trevor directly on Twitter. We want to give a shout out, obviously, to our Skettle students. And I think you, Trevor, had another group of people you wanted to say hi to. Yeah, just a quick shout out to uh, the students at Murray State University in Kentucky. Uh, a friend of mine and his students there are, are listening and reading along with us. So thank you and thank you to all of you. And lastly, if you are listening on this podcast, please subscribe as well as like or review. I'm told that it really helps with the algorithms on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts in order for other people to find this podcast and join our, our journey as we read through Camus. Great. Thank you. Welcome to Pandemic Dialogues from the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. This series seeks to sustain the intellectual community we built with students, ASU colleagues, and the wider community while our regular speaker events are postponed. We offer the dialogues in two modes, a series of live webinars, each discussing a great work on pandemics and civic crisis, and this podcast with extended discussion of Camus' novel, The Plague. More on the dialogues and the school is at 
S-C-E-T-L dot A-S-U dot E-D-U.